So hello everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Partha Mandal. I am the Vice President of SAW branch. Uh, today we are uh, redoing the webinar, uh, which was supposed to happen a couple of weeks ago because of some technical issue. We just uh, reorganized that. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is a webinar series, which will be hosted by SAW branch. And our speaker is uh, Dr. Michinori Asaka uh, from uh, INPEX. He's going to talk about a predictive anisotropic rock physics model of sale and its practical application uh, field result. So before we start, SA want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather today and the many lands which undertake our work. We recognize their uh, continuing connection to these lands, water and culture and pay our respects to their elders past and present. Before we uh, go to the actual presentation scenario, so I would like to thanks to our corporate members uh, without their support, uh, running the ASEC will be quite difficult. So uh, thanks uh, all of them. We also want to thanks to our specific branch sponsor, especially like uh, Western Australia and uh, from uh, South Australia and uh, Northern Territory. A couple of housekeeping rules, uh, probably who have already done or joined several times, it should be fine. Uh, but uh, for whoever joining for the first time in the Zoom, so normally uh, there is a question answer option. You can able to see QA. And uh, if you click on that function, you can able to type your question as the talk is uh, going on. But we'll uh, take back to this question once the speaker finished his uh, speech, and then uh, we'll discuss. So possibly I can read out uh, to our speaker and he probably going to answer. Uh, why you should be a member of SA, couple of benefits. So of course we have uh, high quality research result and case study published through Exploration Geophysics. We have some monthly magazine, as well as entry to SA conference. And also there is a quite bit of a different networking events, social events, as well as tech nights happen across the branch. Uh, for students, it's a great opportunity uh, as uh, most of the membership is free for them and a uh, half price for the retirees and uh, recent graduates. So uh, mostly monthly newsletter released uh, by the email network. So uh, also the events you can follow up through the link here. And uh, any of the speech or webinar already happened before, uh, all are available through the ASEC videos. So you, you probably can type in if you want to listen uh, some of those previous talk. With that, I would like to welcome uh, Michinari Asaka. Uh, to share his screen and uh, start his speech. Thank you. Asaka, you can share your screen. Yep. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me start my presentation. My name is Michinori Asaka. I'm a geophysicist at IMPEX. Today, I would like to talk about rock physics model of shale and how it can be used for the prediction of anisotropy parameters. So this modeling study was conducted when I was a PhD student at NTNU. And uh, a part of this modeling study has been published in JGR Solid Earth. So this is the outline of my presentation. The first, I will talk about introduction to this modeling study. 
Then I will talk about the model proposed in this study. Then move on to field data application. Then I will conclude my presentation. So first of all, I would like to talk about elastic anisotropy of shells. The elastic anisotropy is the dependence of elastic response on rocks orientation. For example, the relationship between the applied stress and the resultant strain might be different in the vertical and the horizontal direction. And in particular, shells are strongly anisotropic. So this figure shows scanning electron micrograph of a shell taken from Kimmerich clay formation. And this image suggests the presence of local alignment of clay particles as indicated by black rectangles. And those local alignment is a key source of shell anisotropy. In terms of the type of anisotropy, shells can be reasonably approximated as transversely isotropic rock, in which the relationship between the applied stress and the resultant strain can be described by five independent stiffness, C11, C33, C44, C66, and the C13 in the off-diagonal component. To describe the strength of anisotropy, Thomson's anisotropy parameters are commonly used. Epsilon is a function of C11 and C33 and is approximately equal to the fractional difference between the horizontal and the vertical P wave velocity. Similarly, gamma is a function of C66 and C44 and is approximately equal to the fractional difference between the horizontal and the vertical S wave velocity. The physical meaning of delta is not as clear as epsilon and gamma, but this parameter affects seismic normal move out velocity and is a function of C13, which is an off diagonal component. So this figure shows epsilon versus delta cross plot for shells used in this modeling study. The anisotropy parameter ranges from 0 to 0 0.6, and this has significant impact on the subsurface characterization. The elastic anisotropy affects seismic data and the geomechanical response in various ways. For example, Seismic AV response is significantly affected by anisotropy. This figure shows reflection coefficient as a function of instant angle at the interface between the overburden shell and underburden sandstorm. Underburden sandstorm was assumed to be isotropic. And the five different anisotropy parameters were tested for overburden shell. The tested range of the delta is from 0 to 0 0.2, and the epsilon was assumed to be 1.3 times larger than delta. This dashed line is the isotropic response in which overburden delta is zero, and the small increase in the overburden delta has a significant impact on the reflection coefficient. When the overburden delta is 0 0.2, the reflection coefficient is completely different from the isotropic response. Stress concentration and induced for pressure around the borehole is also affected by elastic anisotropy. Induced for pressure means changes in pore pressure caused by stress concentration. And this figure shows induced pore pressure at borehole wall. The response in the anisotropic rock is given by solid line, and the response in the isotropic rock is given by dashed line. So this view is looking down the hole, and the stress in the plane perpendicular to borehole is SV and SH max. And in this case, SH max is larger than SV. The anisotropy parameter used in this modeling is shown here on the left. Delta of 0 0.12, epsilon of 0 
and the gamma of 0.6 were used. Isotropic rock shows positive induced pore pressure at top and the bottom of the borehole. The positive induced pore pressure means there is an increase in pore pressure. And there is a negative induced pore pressure at the size of the borehole. But an isotropic rock doesn't show significant induced pore pressure. And the difference can be as large as 10 megapascal, which cannot be ignored in the practical situations. The elastic anisotropy is, however, often ignored in the oil and gas industry, mainly because it is difficult to measure in the parameters and fields, and also it is difficult to estimate those parameters from limited information. Thompson, 2019, for example, he stated that despite the clarity of this conclusion, the point has been generally ignored for over 30 years. Almost all AV analysis ignore the anisotropic term, so which means there's a significant gap between our theoretical understanding and our practical implementation in the oil and gas industry. So the purpose of this modeling study is to fill this gap. In particular, I focused on the estimation and the modeling of anisotropy parameters in shells through appropriate anisotropy rock physics model. So let me talk about the model used in this study. I will talk about four observations regarding shells, which have to be accounted for in the modeling step. The first one is clay mineral is expected to have strong elastic anisotropy. Unfortunately, elastic moduli for clay minerals have not been measured due to technical difficulties. However, mask white properties has been measured, which is similar to elite in terms of structure and composition. Therefore, the elastic property of mask white can also be considered to be similar to that of elite. This table on the right is mask white elastic properties. Delta is about 0 0.09, and epsilon and gamma are a very large value, which are larger than one. This strong elastic anisotropy of clay minerals is not accounted for in the model, in the rock physics model in the past. And the second one is shale rocks are comprised of stacks of locally aligned clay particles. So as I mentioned earlier, this image suggests the presence of local alignment of clay particles. And this local alignment is often called domain, and this is a key source of shale anisotropy. However, this kind of internal structure is often ignored in the model in the past. On the other hand, outside of the rock physics community, there are experiments on confined liquid. Confined liquid means liquid confined in narrow space. For example, Andognosi et al. 2001, they performed experiment on the confined liquid. They confined liquid between proof and the base, and they applied sinusoidal displacement to this proof. And they tried to measure shear viscosity and shear rigidity of this confined liquid. The right hand side is the result of this experiment. The top black curve shows shear rigidity as a function of tip sample distance. And the tip sample distance means uh, the distance between the proof and the base. And as the tip sample distance becomes very small, like nanometer scale, the confined liquid showed shear rigidity. Since the pore size of shell is also nanometer scale, those experiments su suggest the finite shear stiffness of bound water. The fourth one is mechanical compaction affects the orientations of the domain. So this image shows scanning electron micrograph of high-porosity mud sample 
right below the seafloor on the left and the image of the low frosty shell on the right. The bud sample right below the seafloor shows more or less random orientation of the domain, but low frosty shell shows more aligned clay particles. And this is the impact of compaction. As shown in the figure on the right, right after the deposition, the orientation of the domain is more or less random, but increasing compaction results in more aligned clay particles. So in summary, those four elements have to be accounted for in the modeling step. Clay particle strong elastic anisotropy, clay particle local alignment, and the finite shear stiffness of bound water and the orientation of the domain. The first three elements can be taken into account by the Sayers and Denbo approach. So this is basically the anisotropic hashing stigma estimates. And by using this method, domain can be modeled as clay particles embedded within the soft isotropic background. We can use mask bite elastic properties for the clay platelet, and the background is characterized by bulk modulus and the shear modulus. So it is possible to, to take the finite shear stimulus into, the, into account. And the orientation of the domain is accounted for by the compaction orientation distribution function. So the idea is to estimate orientation distribution from the degree of compaction by using this equation. So W is the orientation distribution function. And this is a function of alpha, which is the compaction factor. The compaction factor can be estimated from the current porosity and the initial porosity. And the empirical equation proposed by Fia et al. Is, is used in this study to estimate the initial porosity. So theta, this is the angle between the vertical axis and the short axis of the domain. And this plot shows W as a function of theta. I used four different compaction factor from one to four. And the compaction factor of one means random orientation. So the W is constant across theta. And increasing compaction factor result in the increased amount of nearly horizontal domains. So given this distribution, we can perform the weighted average of elastic properties of domain according to this distribution. So this is uh, the modeling workflow. Three-step procedure was adopted here. And the step one is Sayers and Denbo approach in which domain is modeled as clay particles embedded within the soft isotropic background and the mask white elastic properties were used for the clay particles. In step two, weighted average was performed according to the compaction ODF. So compaction ODF was estimated from the current porosity and the initial porosity. In the third step, the impact of other minerals such as quartz and calcites were added. The so three parameters in this modeling workflow is clay particle aspect ratio, and the background bulk and the shear modulus. So those are parameters in step one. And the last parameter is relative position within two averaging methods. This is the parameter for step two. And we can perform the weighted average by using two different methods, risk average and the void average. So that's why the relative position within these two averaging methods was adapted as a parameter. But this relative position is not as important as other parameters. So this model can be used for the prediction of anisotropy parameters. Usually in the field, it is not possible to measure delta and epsilon 
So the idea is to optimize the model parameters using the available information, such as C33, C44, and C66. And the optimized model gives all the stiffness so that we can estimate anisotropy parameters, delta and epsilon. So in the next slide, I'd like to talk about the model parameters optimization. The model parameter optimization was performed by bridge search to minimize the normalized fit error defined here. So C mod means model stiffness and C mess means measure the stiffness. So the first term is the error in C33. And the second term is the error in C44. And the last term is the error in C66. So what I did is I calculated the model stiffness using a various combination of the model parameters. Then try to find the model parameter combination which minimize this normalized fit error. And to see the robustness of this bridge search, the fit error was calculated for the various model parameter combination. And the fit error was plotted as a function of one model parameter. So this left-hand side is a result for Norwegian seashell. And the right-hand side is the re result for the Opalinus clay shaded patches. So here, fit error is plotted as a function of the background bug modulus and the background shear modulus. So these blue points, this looks like a line, but actually points. So each blue point, each blue point represents a possible combination of the model parameter. So that's why for a given parameter, there's uh, many uh, blue points. And if you look at the shape of these blue points, the shape shows narrow value, which means the grid search is robust. And the model parameter combination, which minimize this fit error, is considered to be the optimal model parameters. So the optimized background bulk modulus for this sample is around 2.7 gigapascal, which is consistent with saturated fluid in this case, brine. And the optimized uh, background shear modulus was about 0 0.7 gigapascal. And this is very small compared to bulk modulus. And this is consistent with existing experiment. And we can see the same result for the opalinus clay shaded patches. So let me compare the optimized model and the measurements. Left hand side is the Jurassic shell, and the right hand side is a comparison for B3 shell. On the top right, the optimized background bulk, bulk modulus and the background shell modulus is shown. The optimized background bulk modulus for Jurassic shell was 2.7 gigapascal, and the optimized background shell modulus was 0 0.22 gigapascal. So here, stiffness is. C33, C44, and C66, those are plotted as a function of velocity. And at the bottom, the anisotropy parameter, delta, epsilon, gamma, are plotted as a function of velocity. Measurements are given by circles, and the model is given by solid line. And you can see a very good matching between the model and the measurements for those stiffness. But this is not a surprising result because those stiffness was used for the model parameter optimization. And what is more interesting is not only stiffness, but also an isotropy parameter delta and epsilon shows a very good matching. And this result implies that the model can be used for the prediction of an isotropy parameter delta and epsilon from limited information. And we can see a uh, uh, same result for B, B3 shell. So this is for other two samples, PL shell uh, on the left and the D2 shell on the right. The PL shell <laughs> water saturation was 
0 0.7 and the optimized bug, 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 bug modulus was 1.53 gigapascal, which is apparently consistent with this viral saturation. Again, we can see a very good matching between the model and the measurements, not only for stiffness, but also for anisotropic parameters, delta and epsilon. So this, the model parameter optimization was performed for various shell samples, and this is the result. So this column shows optimized clay particle aspect ratio, and this column shows the optimized background bulk modulus, and this column shows the optimized background shell modulus. So most of the sample shows the bulk modulus, which is consistent with brine, but two samples, Kimberidge shell and shell two, shows the bulk modulus, which is much smaller than brine. And this might be caused by the assumptions in this modeling process, or there is a possibility of incomplete saturation. And those are other samples. Manco's shell was saturated by decay, and the optimized background bulk modulus was 0.72 gigapascal, and the value is consistent with decay. And the water saturation of Pierre shell was varied from 10% to 70%. And the optimized background bulk modulus shows an increase in the value with the water saturation. So those increase in the bulk modulus is apparently consistent with the water saturation. So those results implies the co co correctness of the model and the model can be used for the prediction of anisotropy parameters. So let me move on to the application to field data. So the idea is the same as before. In field, it is not possible to measure delta and epsilon. So the idea is to optimize the model parameter using the available information, C33, C44, C66, which can be measured by a sonic scanner. Then the optimized model gives anisotropy parameters, delta and epsilon. So this is a result. So the method was applied to the log data acquired in the Western Australia field data. And in this field, sonic scanner was measured in the vertical well. So C33, C44, and the anisotropy parameter gamma, those are measured. And the grid search was performed for each sample. So I performed the grid search for each sample. And the optimized model parameters are shown here on the right. So this is optimized gray particle aspect ratio. And those are optimized background bulk modulus and the shear modulus. And the relative position within two average method was fixed at 0 0.5 because this parameter is not as important as other parameters. So here on the left, the measured stiffness is given by black, and the optimized model stiffness is, is given by red. And you can see a very good matching between those uh, two values. And looking at uh, the optimized background black modulus, the value is around 2.5 to 3 gigapascal. And this value is consistent with brine. And those optimized model parameter gives an isotropy parameter, delta and epsilon, which is shown here at the center. So the estimated delta is given by magenta, and the estimated epsilon is given by blue. So those are upscaled. And those parameter is consistent with the anisotropy parameters estimated through PSD and velocity modulating. So that means those estimates can be used as a prior information for the anisotropic PSD and velocity modulating. And another use of 
of the estimation is, of course, the ABU model. So as I mentioned earlier, the anisotropy has significant impact on the ABU response. And the Ruger's approximation gives analytic insight into the impact of anisotropy. The reflection coefficient can be uh, a function of intercept, gradient, and the curvature. And the gradient is a function of the contrast in delta. And the curvature is affected by the contrast in the epsilon. And those contrasts can be as large as other terms. So it is not possible to ignore those parameters in practice. So those are, again, the application to the log data acquired in Western Australia field. So from the left-hand side, so those are measured BP, measured PS, and the measured density. And this column shows the estimated delta and the epsilon. So delta is given by magenta, and the epsilon is given by blue. And this data, this is isotropic synthetic. And the angle range is from near angle to ultra far angle. So near angle is 12 degree, and the ultra far angle is 47 degree. And on the right hand side is the anisotropic synthetic angle gather. So this is based on the estimated delta and the epsilon. So this interval around uh, 2600 milliseconds. So this interval is thunderstorm. And looking at the AV response at the top of the thunderstorm, isotropic synthetic doesn't show significant AV response, but an isotropic synthetic shows a strong AV response. There is a strong trough event at the top of the thunderstorm in the far and ultra far angle stock. And this is consistent with actual seismic data. The top figure shows near mid stock, and the bottom figure shows ultra far angle stock. And the thunderstorm is located at around the center of this figure, and ultra far stock shows a very strong trough event at the top of the thunderstorm. And this strong heavy response is consistent with this anisotropic synthetic. So the estimated anisotropy parameter can be used for the interpretation of AV response. And the other practical use of estimated anisotropy parameters includes AVU inversion using pseudo isotropic elastic properties and an isotropic ABU projection. So those methods are already published in the leading edge and the geophysics. So please access to those papers if you are interested in. And other application is well bore stability analysis. The estimated anisotropy parameter can be accounted for in the well bore stability analysis using the work workflow proposed by Asaka and Hort last year. In this workflow, the stress concentration around the borehole is estimated by the Amade solution by using anisotropy parameters as an input. Then the induced flow pressure will be estimated by the stress concentration and the anisotropy parameters. Then the effective stress will be estimated by the stress concentration and the induced power pressure and the in-city power pressure. Then the failure regions and modes will be predicted. So let me talk, uh, talk about the induced power pressure. So looking at uh, the right-hand side, for transverse isotropic rock aligned with the coordinate system, the induced power pressure is given by this equation. So V33 and V11, those are anisotropic skeleton speed parameters. And V33 is multiplied by the changes in stress in the vertical direction, and the V11 is multiplied by the changes in horizontal stress. So it's easy to estimate the induced power pressure. 
And this figure shows poop stress at Warhol on the left hand side. And on the right hand side is the induced pore pressure at Warhol. So again, this is the application to Western Australia field. The response in the anisotropic rock is given by the solid line. And the response in the isotropic rock is given by the dashed line. So this view is looking down the borehole and the stress in the plane perpendicular to the borehole is SB and SH max. And in this case, SH max is larger than SB. And correspondingly, there is a stress concentration at the top and the bottom of the borehole. But an isotropic rock shows larger stress, larger hoop stress than the isotropic rock at the top and the bottom of the borehole. And the difference is larger than 10 megapascal. So uh, the difference is larger than 10, 10 megapascal, which cannot be ignored in practice. On the right hand side is the induced pore pressure at Warhol wall. So again, the anisotropic rock is given by solid and the isotropic response is given by the dashed line. Isotropic rock shows positive induced pore pressure at the top and the bottom of the borehole and there's a negative induced pore pressure at the size of the borehole. But an isotropic rock shows opposite behavior. There is a negative induced pore pressure at the top and the bottom and there is a positive induced pore pressure at the size of the borehole. And again, the difference can be as large as 10 megapascal, which cannot be ignored in practice. So let me move on to the discussion and conclusion. So shale rocks are actually complex, and the complexity can be caused by diagenesis. At around 60 to 80 degrees, Smectite will react with the K-Feldspar to generate light and force, and at around 130 to 140 degrees Celsius, kaolinite will react with K-Feldspar to generate light. So those diagenesis result in dehydration and changes in mineralogy, changes in the orientation distribution, and the connection of grains. In terms of the dehydration, this can be accounted for by adjusting porosity and the background bulk and the shear modulus. And the changes in mineralogy can be accounted for by adjusting mineralogy. And the changes in the orientation distribution can be taken into account by adjusting the compaction factor. In practice, Initial porosity is modified, is adjusted to change the compaction factor. And in terms of the connection of grains, clay particle aspect ratio uh, is related to parameters. However, different approach may be necessary in the case of strong cement, because in this case, the background is no longer fluid. So background is likely matrix. In, so in this case, the lower bound of an isotropic Hutchins one estimate cannot be used. And in the case of different type of orientation dis distribution is caused by diagenesis, the combustion of the F cannot be used. So this is too simple orientation. In, that, in this case, we have to, we may have to use uh, other complex orientation distribution. So those limitations have to be reminded when you use this model. I also would like to talk about the impact of available information. In the example in the previous slide, the input parameters was C33, C44, and C66. But the available information depends on the situation. So I tested uh, different input parameter combinations. So I tested four different combinations. The first one is using only C11 and C33. 
And the second op option is using only the vertical and horizontal Young's modulus. And the third option is to use C01, C33, C44. And the last option was the horizontal and uh, vertical Young's modulus and the Poisson pressure. So basically, when I used only to input the parameters, results were unstable. But when three parameters were used for the grid search, the results were stable and reasonable. So those results suggest at least three independent elastic parameters are necessary to reasonably estimate model parameters. Okay, so let me conclude my presentation. A predicted a predictive rock physics model for shells was developed. In practice, clay particle strong elastic anisotropy, clay particle alignment, the bound water shell stiffness, and the domain orientation have to be taken into account in the modeling step. And the first three elements were accounted for by the anisotropic hydrogen stigma estimates with mask white elastic properties. And the domain, domain orientation was accounted for by the convection orientation distribution function with empirical initial velocity. And the applicability of the model to the prediction of anisotropy parameters was tested. And what I found was uh, the model delta and epsilon were consistent with the measured values. And another interesting finding was that optimized background properties are consistent with saturated fluid and the existing experiments. And the method was successfully applied to the log data acquired in the vertical well. And the application example includes a prior information for the PSDM velocity model building, ABA modeling, and well possibility analysis. So that's all from my side. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks, Asaka. Uh, it was a really informative talk. And uh, let's look. I think there is a few questions. So I think uh, there was uh, uh, one, two questions from one of the guys. You can able to see that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. uh, can you explain uh, slide 21? Okay, I can probably read the question. So question was... Uh, uh, Keith, uh, can you explain a little bit more about C33 information is available uh, on uh, slide 21, which you have presented? Okay. Uh, I think okay. probably so, is asking what is referred to C33 and C44, something like that. Okay, so C33, C44. So those can be, uh, C33 can be estimated from the P wave velocity, the vertical P wave velocity and the density. So those are, those can be measured by log data. Similarly, C44 can be measured, uh, can be estimated from uh, the S wave velocity, vertical S wave velocity and the density. Again, those can be measured by log data. So when I say available, it means that those are measured by log data. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, the same guys have another questions. So Muscovite is used analogous to Elite. Can you mention the author what you can read or are there any similar minerals uh, like, so possibly asking about any reference or like Muscovite is analogous to Elite. Mm -hmm. So for other kind of rocks, if it is kaolinite and anything else, how it should be considered. Okay. So, so those similarity is mentioned in. Okay. 
let me show you the paper. Yeah. Can you see this paper? Yes, so plot, I can see it. Yeah, so, so Vivica et al, 2011. So they, they talk about uh, the similarity between the Muscovite and the Elite. And it is also mentioned in, for example, Uh, the coincides in this paper, the elastic okay. properties of clay in shells. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I think another question, I don't know what is his name. Please explain more about uh, Compax and ODF. So probably he want a little bit explanation okay, about that. Compaction uh, ODF. Yeah, so Compaction ODF is uh, theoretical orientation di distribution when the compaction is solely caused by uniaxial compaction. <laughs> and when, when the compaction is caused by the uniaxial compaction, the compaction factor can be estimated from the current porosity and <laughs> initial porosity. Then this estimated compaction factor can be used for this theoretical prediction of orientation distribution. So if you look at this figure on the right, when the compaction factor is one, which means uh, right after the deposition, the orientation is random. So the W is constant for all theta. But when the compaction is significant, like compaction factor of one, there's an increase in the amount of horizontal clay particles. So this is basically the theoretical orientation, assuming the unit actual compaction. <laughs> okay. So slide 29, I don't know what is the question is. It is asking like what kind of code or software used to plot the result? Uh, I'm using MATLAB to, to make this figure. Okay. I think I, I have one question if anyone don't have. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when you show that uh, say isotropic synthetic versus uh, anisotropic on that slide, so will you use a, a constant yeah. wavelet or like a still angle dependent wavelet? Uh, in this case, the wavelet is constant. Okay. But in reality, the wavelet varies uh, as a function of offset. So yeah, in reality, we have to use offset dependent wavelet. Yeah, so some of the times like uh, I have seen because in the, although we are applying in the isotropic domain, but since people using angle dependent wavelet, although it's not a applying isotropic equation using angle dependent wavelet, sometimes this correction has been reduced, but in reality it should be uh, applied uh, with anisotropic correction. So I think we still industry is uh, considering that angle dependent wavelet to apply some kind of that correction rather than directly going to the anisotropic domain. So what is your thought on that? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So basically the impact of anisotropy can be, can be estimated by extracting, extracting wavelet for each offset. And if you see some unrealistic, unrealistic behavior, such as the very large wavelet at uh, ultra far and sucks, so that might be an indication of the presence of, of anisotropy. 
Okay, nice. Thanks. And uh, and also maybe one quick question: If the oil is not no longer vertical, uh, how we can able to uh, tackle that situation? Like if you have some deviated oil, when you go for that stress calculation on that another application, uh, how we can able to tackle that situation? Uh, that's a good uh, good question. When the well is deviated, uh, the sonic scanner no longer gives uh, C66. Yeah. Maybe a pr practical solution is to acquire quad data and measure the velocity in the oblique so that we can measure velocity in the multiple direction. Yeah. Then optimize the model parameter for that quad data and extend that uh, uh, rock physics model parameter to the entire log interval. So that might be a, a practical solution. Okay, thanks. And uh, anyone have any more questions? We have, I think, a couple of minutes, three, four minutes left. And uh, I think already Asaka mentioned this work already published on that uh, journal. So probably you can go through that. Uh, probably if required, you can reach out to him. His email is there. So once again, uh, thanks uh, Asaka for giving us a very interesting talk. And uh, uh, thanks for your time and uh, presenting. Look forward to engage with you in near future. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye.